There are obviously many different causes for the persistence of poverty, but one set of causes that is often overlooked is the international institutional architecture that has emerged in the years since the end of the Cold War. So we've got a very dense and influential regime now of rules and conventions, practices and procedures that regulate uh, trade, finance, intellectual property rights and so on. And these rules were uh, put in place by the most powerful governments of the world in negotiations, uh, for example those that led to the founding of the World Trade Organization. But these governments, of course, were influenced by their most powerful constituencies, such as large corporations, banks, hedge funds, billionaires, and so on, uh, who tried to shape these rules in their own favor. As a foreseeable but unintended side effect of uh, these efforts, uh, the rules are uh, beneficial to rich, powerful corporate interests and are uh, not particularly beneficial or actually quite harmful to the world's poor. That is true of protectionism, of pollution rules, of international labor standards, of uh, intellectual property rights and so forth. In all these different regards, uh, the rules of the game are um, making it more difficult for poor populations to participate proportionately in global economic growth and the statistics clearly show that, that inequalities have been increasing in most countries, including most developing countries, and that inequality, or rather polarization, has also increased in the world at large. So the bottom 30% of the world's population have lost ground. They have had about 1.52% of global household income in the year 1988, uh, they were reduced to 1.25% of global household income by 2008. And so they have lost ground. And some of the gains that they would ordinarily have expected to make thanks to global economic growth were uh, compensated for and nullified by the shrinking of their share of global household income. So given this diagnosis, uh, it would be very important, I think, in uh, shaping and reforming these supranational institutional arrangements to ensure that their impact on the global poor is fully taken into account and that they are reshaped in a way that is more friendly to the interests of the poor. So here in particular, we need better labor standards to prevent that race to the bottom that uh, often leads poor countries to compete for foreign capital by offering ever more mistreatable, ever more abusable workforces. Uh, we need pollution rules that will compensate poor populations for the damage that is done to them through uh, international pollution, which is a side effect of the consumption of the rich. We need uh, better intellectual property rights that make sure that poor populations have access to advanced medicines, advanced uh, seeds, and so on. And uh, we need also a reduction in international protectionism in order, again, to make sure that poor populations have ample export opportunities into the developed countries. So what the, the next round of development goals can do depends a lot on what their content is. I think they could achieve a lot if they had concrete institutional reforms as their goals. So uh, some of the examples that I've given would work, uh, reforms in the areas of protectionism, labor standards, pollution rules, and so on. One further thing that I should mention in this context is uh, reforms in regard to the international financial system, in particular trying to curb the system of tax havens, secrecy jurisdictions, shell companies, and sleazy banks that currently enables corporations and rich individuals to avoid paying taxes in poor countries. Uh, this would help tremendously with what is now a big slogan, namely domestic resource mobilization. If we were really serious about that, we could mobilize tremendous amounts of domestic resources in the poor countries simply by ensuring that corporations doing business there and rich people living there or being 
nationals of these countries paid their fair share of taxes.